Welcome everyone to another Ask an Investor session. I'm Pravin, the host of the show and founder of QuidRoom. For all live listeners, please feel free to drop in your questions in the chat here in Zoom. Before we kick start, just as a quick disclaimer, the content shared in here is for information purposes only and should not be construed as legal, investment, tax, financial, or other advice. Our guest today is Rakesh Gupta, founder of Say Invest Group, a firm that assists various business conglomerates, multi-billionaires, and family offices with their investment strategies, M&As, and more. Before starting his own venture, Rakesh led senior divisional president CEO roles in SL, Reliance, and Hinduja Group, three of the biggest multi-diversified Indian conglomerates. Hi, Rakesh. Hi, uh, Praveen. Pleasure to be uh, speaking to you. Great. It's good to have you on board as well here, uh, Rakesh. See, um, today, so what we have in hand is an interesting topic. We're going to be discussing a little bit about investment strategies of billionaires. So, Rakesh, um, let's let's just kick start by by understanding exactly what are your personal life experiences that has led you to being a subject matter expert on this topic? Uh, prior to that, I will just touch base on the journey uh, from the from the days I started dealing with this uh, millionaires from the days they when they were ultra millionaires and then they became billionaires. Mm -hmm. And it goes from my background about investment banking and largely about dealing about the private wealth and you know private portfolios and then subsequently uh, when we move ahead and we try to build up the global portfolios and that's the time I started working with them and then gradually I started uh, managing their private portfolio be it at the Ambani's or be it at the Hindujas or be it the Chandra's and that is how it went ahead and over the period of time my role was uh, Initially, it started with more of an investment manager to the senior investment manager to the portfolio manager, and gradually it became the chief of it and chief of the business, uh, uh, including managing the ultra private family part. So that is how over a period of three decades of investment banking, family office, ultra family office, and then uh, gradually the family office, billionaire family office desk, which I launched. So this is how uh, we ended up at Signvest. Uh, advisory where we deal with the ultra billionaires uh, space uh, we don't deal with uh, anybody who is a or who is a single digit billionaire possibly i have not mm -hmm. yet stepped into that space but i'm sure and uh, me and my elite team at sign west we are going to uh, get into the bigger business and do better and all across the verticals looking beyond uh, single digit billionaire well, that's great. That, that's good to know that, uh, that that the team is expanding and the work that you are doing right now is also um, also growing as well. Um, now, on that, because you have so much experience in working with these, these billionaires and also from the state that they have been millionaires and they became billionaires as well, we'll just start to understand exactly how they usually behave, right? So I'm not sure whether you have the same opinion, but my personal experience is that um, billionaires especially the, and, and, and also their family offices in the Indian subcontinent are very secretive on how and what they invest in as compared to their European or US counterparts like Kirkby or Harold Quant, to name a few. They're, they're very open with their investment thesis and, and what they invest into, which uh, some may say promote more of a collaborative environment. Any reason for the less collaborative or more secretive behavior of, of family offices in our in our region? Uh, I would quote uh, two of the examples. One is that uh, Alice Walton, I don't know how many of you know Alice Walton, the owner of Walmart family. And today they're valued close to 60 odd billion dollars. Uh, but the point is that Alice Walton long back said that possibly you try to look at uh, businesses which has a passive uh, growth income stream mindset and that is what possibly 
opened a lot of doors because when when you are trying to be a passive with regard to building up the growth and development, that is why American uh, because I've spent more time in the in the U.S. largely because I studied there. I've been quite an active with regard to openness, building co what I call old old school co building or co leveraging strength. Mm -hmm. But when you look at Indian billionaires, I think the point is that why they are not yet open up largely because the family office concept in India has come very late. Erstwhile, it used to be HUF kind of a structure. I don't know, uh, maybe we, our international uh, uh, you know, listener may not understand HUF is a Hindu undivided family. So it used to be everything is to be one part and that is how it used to be run. In the new era of professional, it has, it has become a family office. So India is still, Indian billionaires are still grappling up with the new concept of the, of the family office and the structure, the governance, the financial prudent policy, and so many other things, corporatizations. And that is how possibly they are, they are yet to open up. Uh, some of them have opened up, they have opened their uh, desk in New York and London, and, and, and you know we've been dealing with some of them, but largely the new era or the younger billionaires who are now coming up from the India desk, possibly India is one of the only country which produces more uh, sub 40 billionaires than anywhere else in the world. And they are quite open. But the point which is that larger population, which is above 65 or around late 60s kind of it, they are still yet to open because they still come from the old school of mindset of HUF. That's why they are taking time. But most of them are now building up the um, much stronger the professional setup, which is helping them to grow. And I think that's that's where the difference is. So Indian billionaires are going to make, they are making headlines, uh, but yes, over a period of time, I think they will be far more open, uh, similar to the American ones. Interesting. And uh, do you feel that right now, uh, the, the current status quo, um, uh, there is quite a bit of disparity in the way in the investment portfolio of Indian uh, billionaires as compared to the Western ones? If so, what are the usual disparities that you see? Perfect. So the Western billionaires with whom we deal, because we at SignVest, we deal with 12 billionaires uh, prominently across the world and they are valued mm -hmm. $3.7 billion. So we have got our own billionaire portfolios. But to compare uh, or to put a perspective, I would say the Western billionaires are still quite uh, passionate or I would say quite bullish on uh, equity space, you know, listed equity space, as well as hedge funds. Mm -hmm. okay. Indian billionaires are going away from the liquidity space and hedge funds, they have limited understanding. So they don't put bigger or possibly should I say they, they don't put more eggs in the hedge funds compared to the Western one. And the Western ones are the one who have, who, are, who have a predominant mindset of investing uh, even in the opportunistic space or the private capital space where it has been, uh, where the financial prudence policy and the financial governance is in place. Wherein Indian billionaires think that Yes, these are the opportunistic space and then they gradually build it up over a period of time. So these are the two big contrasting differences they both have. And I think they, they both have their own success, right? Let's be honest to accept India today produces, uh, India is the third largest number of billionaires across the world, 166 and India produces possibly 0 0.11 billionaire per, per, per million, which is, uh, you know, looking at the number of, or the population, it is amazing. So that is what possibly, Indians are leading in their own way. Western have proven themselves. Now, as, and and um, on that note, do you feel that uh, currently the new billionaires that are coming out in the market, um, do you feel their wealth that they are accumulating at this point of time and the investment that they do uh, is quite a bit influenced with the assets, liabilities and ambitions of their principal business? To the Western side, uh, yes, because uh, I don't know, I would like to quote here Michael Dell's wonderful line is that, and which which I, you know, when I met him at 2014 and we were talking and, and, and he said something very good. He said, align your investment goals with your personal values, which is very strong on the West. You know, let me tell you, Michael Dell, we all know about Michael Dell and Susan Dell and what, what they're doing across the world. 
I think that's where possibly Western uh, billionaires have, have been miles ahead than the other part, maybe because of the education or the upliftment or because of society or the financial know-how or the strong financial domain background uh, compared to other side of the world. So I think that's where uh, Western billionaires are being uh, doing quite well with regard to their investment goals and their beliefs. Uh, maybe and and possibly from the philanthropic side also they are they are doing remarkably well. So that's why they are balancing it out because what they are doing is that they are they are making money but but they are again equating or you know putting it with the personal values about education, giving it back to society and so many things. That's something Hindujas have been doing for ages. Uh, that make make money but but give it to back to society because everybody is uh, entitled to free education and free hospitality so that's how possibly every billionaire has their own way uh indian billionaires are coming on that league and and uh, you you mentioned that there is quite a bit of investments being done by western uh, billionaires into hedge funds and into the public equity market uh with the with the current uh, current uh market conditions has have you noticed that there has been a change in the way which they uh manage their portfolio oh there's been drum you know uh, drastic change uh, because hedge fund ratio in terms of in investment portfolio allocation has gone down mm -hmm. private equity has gone up but private equity has gone up uh significantly and also in the space which is a uh, non-startup kind of phase. Okay. So very selective, you will find billionaires getting into a startup space until unless either they see a strong demand with the, with the number trajectory or they see a strong leadership. And here I would like to quote something which we have been taught at Columbia also is that one of the very simple thing in the new era of startups is that look at the leadership and then try to give a 30% extra weightage in terms of leadership base before taking a financial decision. And I think this is where possibly uh, it's a it's a new market because uh, majority of the billionaires in a couple of years back, if I'm not wrong, uh, and maybe if, if the time permits, I'll share a wonderful story also. In 2012, when a lot of booming startups were coming up and 2013, 14, when I was at Hindujas, majority of the investment we used to turn down because they were the startups. Mm -hmm. But today, when you look at, uh, when, when I interact with billionaires and they said, we are, we are open for startups provided they have either a success uh, track in terms of uh, due diligence and the study report or else they have a very strong leadership background who can navigate through the difficult times. Hmm. I think these are the two qualities which, which they are open to create an exception to invest in the startups. Otherwise, they all are you know, looking at CDC and, and, and above in the private capital market. And they are quite uh, open to take a bet in this market because some of them have, have really made big tickets or big bucks so, American word big bucks would be more much more appropriate in the Asian part wheels a big ticket so that is how they both have been changing hands and uh, when it comes to um, the changing of hands um, we have been using the, the the terminology billionaire quite a bit but is it usually the billionaire himself or herself who gets involved or is are there other people who manage the wealth who usually take these decisions on what to invest into? My experience says all billionaires get their hands into it. Okay. But the quantum or the involvement would be limited to different subjectivity. So the new ideal billionaire office is more about a real old school investment banking corporate office where you have a CEO, where you have a CIO, where you have a COO, then you have a bunch of investment manager, account managers, personal managers. Account manager largely takes care of all accounting, taxes, jurisdiction, liabilities kind of it, part with the card to uh, uh, operational issues. Personal manager largely takes care about personal holdings, equity divestment, equity ownerships kind of it. Mm -hmm. CIO generally takes care, has a bunch of three to five investment managers who largely take care of uh, invest, reinvest, rebalance, churning of portfolio. So that is what the investment portfolio takes. 
collectively, they all lead to CEO, who generally happens to be handpicked by the billionaire himself, by, by virtue of his knowledge or by, by virtue of his personal uh, uh, knowing him for donkey's years, whichever way we want to look at it. Mm -hmm. And I think this is where, uh, at the end of the time, the decision lies with CEO office. Uh, okay. Because that CEO works with the uh, patron or the chief every day, kind of it. Uh, and I could give my example. When I was at the Hindujas, I, I used to deal with him twice a day in the morning, in the evening. Uh, so every investment which used to come across will come into my desk and I'll go through my team and everything. And then I'll speak to him at the end of the day. And the, the best part is that these guys are seasoned guys. So they can smell and tell you actually is that, okay, take a call on this or just, just put a hold on this. So from the education perspective, they are, they are largely away from the decision making apart from giving the directions, but from the operational perspective, they do have a say every now and then to say how this is happening and what is changing and what are changing. So yes, they're involved into it. Interesting. And, uh, now, since we actually talked about the family office on a scale of 10, how institutionalized do you feel the family offices of these billionaires are at this time? I would say six and a half kind of it. Oh, wow. So what should we, what should they do to reach a nine out of 10, according to your opinion? See, Western have reached almost eight and a half, nine, because what they have done is that, and something which is very good we need to learn also is that most of them have put a complete a compliance and regulatory team in the setup. And that is why possibly I'll give them one, one and a half extra compared to, S, to the rest of the world. The other side of the world, they still believe is that compliance and uh, regulatory work can be managed through external sources on piecemeal distribution basis, or whichever way one, one would like to read at it. And I think uh, when you look at the secrecy and confidentiality of the business, I think this is where possibly this could also lead to your first question when you said about secrecy and not being so open. Because when you give your most important thing, which is regulatory and jurisdiction, so that means you're opening your book to somebody external consultant and how can you rely on that keeping in terms of a new confidentiality regime going all across the world? Because every regulator wants to have a hand on law on it. That's not possibly the Western, you also you already have a very typical CPA who's, who sits and manages a lot of things. But now what they have done is that now they have got a regulatory officer also there in the setup in-house who takes care of majority of the things, including jurisdictions and so many other things. And I think that's where it makes big difference. And, and I do believe that uh, these are the things which, which one can carry on, that why West has got eight and a half and, and East and here I would say Middle East. Middle East would be around, let's say five and a half, six, and maybe Asia would be six point five to seven. So this is how the differentiation happens. Uh, UK would I would still say seven because here the uh, uh, regulatory consulting piece is quite streamlined, quite professional. So that's why possibly I would give it here. But America I would say because they, they have most of the setup is in house. I, I deal with some of them directly and, and I can sense that they all are highly qualified, well-established, uh, huge experience in terms of dealing with multi-jurisdiction systems and you know the, the process, the banking law. So I think they're they are better. And uh, um, on that note, um, since, uh, since you have mentioned that and you have a very strong opinion that the compliance department should be internal uh, rather than outsourced, uh, what part of a family office can actually be outsourced? I would say nothing. Okay. Because, I, you, know, you know, let me quantify that statement. Because majority of the family office wealth you are going to talk about is in individual names. And so you're opening up a Nura box to somebody else and you don't know whether it will be misused or it will be sold off and so many else. Because today a lot of these family offices are fighting with Google and everybody else in terms of social media that how come this detail is there, right? Mm -hmm. Some time back, we have seen the fight between Elon Musk and, uh, and you know, Google where he you know, fought tooth and nail with them that how come his personal email address and everything else is in public domain, but you do not know who has disclosed it, right? And, and that's, that's possibly why I would suggest, and 
and I keep advocating is that please have a full proof in our system, have the right people in the right space. Don't try to handpick people because you know them for two decades or three decades because you don't know when when he will turn the other way out, right? Uh, so that's that's where possibly I I would say a family office or a billionaire office and and the type of billionaires we deal, they have got everything in house. Nothing goes out of it. Interesting. Now, since you actually mentioned about Elon Musk, that brings me to the next question, right? Because recently we have seen numerous numerous examples of tweets and and other publicized opinions of billionaires creating an impact on the value of public and private companies, even whole asset classes. As you know, what happened with digital assets when Musk did what he did. But anyways, what's your opinion on how this will continue to manipulate the markets moving forward? The digital assets or, or LNR? No, no, no. How how no how billionaires and billionaires and their opinion on asset classes on companies how would that keep on impacting the value of the asset in the coming years? See um, their public opinion. Perfect. Here I will quote uh, something important because uh, I am also an external speaker with World Bank. And here I will quote a live example. So World Bank asked me to go and address the Asian Billionaire Summit in Macau on ESG and impact so that people would move and move to SDGs and so many other things started happening. There. And that's the first time possibly I interacted with a bunch of 50 odd billionaires in one room. And majority of the time when the billionaires uh, where they, they were talking about largely about still going around a typical investment return investment scenarios instead of looking at alternate space in term when i say alternate space i'm not talking about structured notes and so many other things i'm only talking about impact and, and, and esg subjectivity here i i would say that i had seen the change in the mindset now they are talking about impact and esg a uh, mm -hmm. little bit maybe uh, in quantum of 10 to 50 million a, a year kind of scenario. If I take that case of 2018 to 2022, I would say there's a huge change now. Now the understanding or the uh, possibly the mindset is changing that yes, a big portion of my wealth should also go back to the social cause and the community cause. And here I would quote uh, Two of the people whom I know very well, uh, Azim Premji and Shiv Nadar. And they both have a wonderful mindset to say that what I've given, it is, it is not important that you are well known by your bankers and lawyers and everybody else, but it is also well known by what by the community and the society. And that's where possibly people have started uh, moving away. From a traditional investment portfolios of hedge funds or similar kind of a listed equity space to far more uh, opportunities like green tech, clean tech, med tech, and all those things they are aggravating it, keeping in view that's a bit of it goes to the social cause also. And I think that that's a change I've been seeing for the last four or five years where um, now they are saying, okay, fine, is it the med tech? Is it something which is helping the society to? get better, it is something on the health side, let me invest it, let me go into it. So the private capital space is now opening up much better in compared to five years back. Mm -hmm. Private capital space, especially in terms of investment strategy or investment products is changing big way, keeping in terms of they are doing it for mankind, society like health tech, a lot of new health initiatives which can cure uh, some, uh, some disease can in, enhance your lifespan or a lot of other things. So they are in, investing in that, keeping in terms that the net of return could be minimal or could be negligible kind of it. But they will also do one, one tick box is that, yes, I'm away from hedge fund, but I'm doing something good. Interesting. So uh, there, there's one question from one of our guests and it's more of a direct question. Uh, what, what are the ideal ways in which I can reach out to these billionaires, um, especially in regards to our new private equity fund? Oh, reaching out to billionaires is always a daunting task. You, you don't reach out to billionaires till you know them. 
So uh, you could know them uh, through the public platform, attend sessions, seminars, possibly go to meet them, or once you interact with them at one of the platform and then you can build it up. Uh, it's very difficult to get a trust of a billionaire, to be very honest, uh, until unless you, you know them. Uh, because once, and it's a mindset, uh, and I'll not name a billionaire, but uh, I met a billionaire in California a couple of months back. And I said, you know, listen, this guy was talking about you. He said, Rakesh, there are so many people talking about me. It is important if I talk about them. So that's yeah. the point is that in those forums or public forums, the, the billionaires met, meet so many different set of people, but do they uh, carry them or, you know, do they follow them? No, until unless you build up some wonderful proposition, uh, you go and meet them to, to talk to them. I would suggest before going to meeting the billionaire, meet the executive team because they are the one, if they like the proposition, they, they will have to do one-on-one -on -one with the billionaire because at the end of the day, he will take the call. Okay. So meet the executive team of the billionaire's office. Uh, that's a very good first step and it will open a much bigger uh, opportunity for you. Okay, all right. I think um, that's sound advice. Now, I just want to uh, uh, understand a little bit more about about say invest uh, service, especially around the family office part of things, because you had mentioned before that family ops uh, usually when a family office is created, everything should be internal. So, how would say invest be able to help with a family office that is currently doing everything internally uh, for a billionaire? Uh, see, uh, the thing is that we deal with these people, uh, the executive team very well, and I, I largely manage the, uh, the top to bottom approach. So okay. I know the billionaires, so I, I, I meet them, if, if not anything else, once in a quarter at least, because that's what the structure financial practice says. If not, then we meet on and off when I'm in New York or when I'm in London or when I'm in Bombay or in Singapore, wherever I am, I try to reach out to them for a meeting and that's where they talk about what is happening and what is not happening. And if we have something interesting, we we just speak to their uh, CEO and say that, you know, can you please organize this uh, as a next step? Because the, the Patriot has given a go ahead. So mm -hmm. uh, to address your point, we have a direct access uh, with the billionaire himself. And we always request him to lies with his own team in his own sweet little way. And we are happy to come and meet the thing. See, I would suggest the very best thing one would look at is that don't give an impression that you want to bypass the executive team. Respect the executive team because he has, he has bought or, or, or he has set up that executive team. If you go and deal with him every time, maybe after the first or maybe after the second time, he'll say, okay, fine, why don't you deal with them directly? So we say, okay, fine, sir, we are parking it to you, but we are also taking up with your CEO and the corporate team to take it through. Uh, somewhere I've read wonderful thing is that is family office the new investment banking vehicle? Uh, yes, to be very honest, if you really look at that people, maybe investment banking has got thousands and thousands of people with my bank banking experience, but family office would have maybe 12 to 20 people kind of set up, but they would do a very ultra investment banking deals kind of, uh, as I said, investing, reinvesting, balancing, rebalancing, churning the portfolio, building the the portfolio divestment so many other things they have to do so yes that's what it is no, absolutely so just one final question from john um there is so john always wondered what amount of investment decisions uh billionaires take by themselves and what is handled purely by the family office what's your uh, take on that okay. So I would be the, more interested in understanding what kind of asset classes really interest billionaires to actually get involved profusely. Okay. <laughs> and which ones they just leave it, leave alone and they say, you know what, this is too much, this is too boring for me, you guys take care of it. So oh, I would suggest here, uh, I think John, thank you for that question, that's a wonderful one. Majority of the, you know, until unless it's a big ticket call, the billionaires himself doesn't get into it. And this is where they have differentiated that their executive team will take certain calls, which they will not. So, so to be very honest, majority of the cases up to 20, 30 million kind of or 50 million kind of in direct investment. Uh, they may ask one or two questions, but they don't get into the decision making. 
0.1. Second, the moment they see that the opportunity has a very strong leadership from maybe Wharton, Harvard, Columbia, they back themselves away because they know that the financial jargons will be thrown up too much on them. So that's yeah. when they say, okay, why, why don't the executive team takes care of it? So yes, up to a ticket size of 50 million, they don't get into it, nitty gritties of it, other than meeting the promoter or the meeting the owner once. Uh, above 50 million, they would like to have a discussion uh, specifically about how the what is the roadmap, what is the deployment and similar things. But when they see, uh, and also one should understand that they also want to now walk in the new era where the promoters are highly qualified. Okay. Uh, the best part is that, uh, and, and I quote this example, is that COVID has taught all of us that we, why do we need good leaders not good businessmen, good leaders who can navigate through. And some time back, I was uh, conducting an interview with, uh, with somebody and he said that COVID was the best uh, CTO. And I said, oh, he's meaning about chief technology officer. He said, no, a chief transforming officer because COVID has transformed all of us in a different part of the world in terms of our operation, in terms of our business, in terms of how do we look out at things, in terms of, of numbers, financials, so many other other things. And that's the best example that JP Morgan has to sublease its main prime property in you know, New York because they, they don't need it, all those things. Majority of the people can still operate from different parts of the world. So, yeah. yes, uh, leadership remains a big critical element which uh, every billionaire wants to jump onto it. Absolutely. Uh, um, in general, do you see billionaires interested in doing well by doing good? That is, are they all about making money or are they driven to better the world as well as make money? You covered quite a bit of this during uh, the session before when you were talking about the philanthropical angle, but if there is anything else that you would like to add uh, to Andrea's question, then that would be good. And to add to Andrea's question, uh, yes, as I said, billionaires are now looking at divesting, of, sorry, at investing a small portion on natural health, as I say, green tech, green tech, uh, health tech, med tech. So, uh, you know, somebody told me, uh, you know, the former owners of Yankees and and uh, sat with us and say, how can we do a health substitute kind of new fund, which will only in invest in health substitute, which can enhance the people's life in terms of sports and non-sports. So uh, when you... When you hear such thing, you do believe, yes, the world has changed. These people are not talking about 10, 12, 15% of Britain, but they are saying that where can we invest, which can do better things to the rest of the world. So to Andrea's point, yes, there are, there are guys who want to take this route saying that, can I help more people in terms of their lifestyle, in terms of their life-saving situation or life-saving drugs, whichever way it works. Interesting. So that's it, uh, Rakesh. I think we covered quite a bit and it was really insightful to understand a little bit more about, about what you had come across firsthand about the way in which billionaires invest and, and the thought process of exactly how they want to set up the family offices. And, and I appreciate your rating system. Uh, gives us a better idea of exactly what to expect uh, from different regions and, their, and, and in terms of sophistication. It was great to host you today. Thank Anyone you. who... Yes. Anyone who wants to reach out to Rakesh, please feel free to ping him in LinkedIn or reach out to me. I can help you to get connected. That's all from us today. Let's make investments better one step at a time. Thanks for listening in. Goodbye for now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.